Hey, what is going on everyone? It's me, Mr. Mario, and welcome back to another episode of Mario's Minute. For those who do not know, this is a podcast I do here monthly in two different forms. First of all, it is available in a video visual form here on the Mr. Mario 2011 YouTube, Rumble, and Odyssey channels. But there's not too much going on there. It's really just my channel art background laid with a uh, cool looking visualizer. At least I think it's a cool looking one and I've gotten some nice compliments on it there. Or you can take it around and listen to it wherever the hell you want to in a audio only form like an actual podcast. Simply look up Mario's Minute on your favorite podcasting app, host, provider, platform, site, and you should hopefully be able to find it. I know it's not available on all of them, but it's available on most of them. Either way, here, Mario's Minute is my second podcast. My main one, Mod Chat, is a little more structured, and that's where I talk about new stuff in the world of video game modding, video game console modding, and that kind of fun landscape. But here, it's completely different. This is where I come on here. Sometimes I have a guest, sometimes I don't. I try and do every other month to have a guest on here, and really, I or we just talk about whatever the hell I want to on this. There's not really all too much structure. It's pretty laid back, and it's a pretty low production type project here but I seem to enjoy doing it. I've been doing it for over six years now, and even though it doesn't get the greatest viewership on here, here's the thing, I really don't care about the viewership on this because it gets more than I would expect, and on top of that, the people who mess with Mario's Minute really, really mess with Mario's Minute, so it's a nice, cool kind of like personal connection outlet and plug to you all. It's a little bit therapeutic for me. It's time to connect with you all, and it's just, you know, it's a fun project that I've liked to do. If I didn't like doing it, I wouldn't have continued to do it for all these months. Either way, though, we're going to be talking about a few different things that I wanted to maybe rant, maybe ramble a little bit about. Um, and you know, I think there's some more rants here this month, but I will honestly say uh, something I have noticed is, uh, you know, in the last uh, few years, really just as I've gotten older, my rants are not as ranty. They're not as animated as they used to be because, you know, my thing is, I'm just like, you know, I just don't really get like that angry about stuff as much. Like not when I was like 18, 19, 20, 21, something like that. I'm just like, you know, at this point now, it's like I can still get the point across still express my disappointment and disbelief, but I don't have to get all uppity and angry about things and be like yelling and all that stuff and be as animated. So uh, that doesn't stop the disappointment from happening though. And one of them here, we're going to be talking about this. And you know, this just feels like, I swear, I talked about something similar to this. And I feel like a lot of this is going to be a repeat, but I talked about this a few months ago in regards to uh, PlayStation with Discovery Channel content. Now to their credit, they did go back and they said, hey, uh, we're going to be canceling this cancellation here, and we're not going to be taking away your Discovery content. Uh, but I just think that is kind of a temporary stopgap. I just think that means we're not taking away Discovery content yet, but it will be taken away later. However, something that doesn't seem to be stopping here is uh, a Funimation shutdown. Now, for anybody who does not know, Funimation is a website where you can pay to consume and stream anime on there. Um, and it is an official way of consuming it. There's no piracy with it. And you do pay a subscription fee. It's similar to Netflix or Hulu, for example. And I'm just going off an article from The Verge uh, covered by Emma Roth in which they say here, Funimation is shutting down and taking your digital library with it. And the main reason for this is they're stating that Funimation is migrating existing subscribers to Crunchyroll when it shuts down in April. So that's been the big thing. To my understanding, the two big streaming sites for anime, at least official ones, you know, here in the Western uh, Hemisphere and such, uh, have been Funimation and Crunchyroll. I think more people have been on Crunchyroll, though. So there was an e email that ended up going out to many people, and I'm just going to read it here verbatim. It was from uh, Crunchyroll on this, and uh, it says here, Service Update. Thank you for being a loyal Funimation subscriber. The Funimation service is ending on April 2nd, 2024. You can still access the content you love on Crunchyroll, which houses one of the largest anime libraries, subs and dubs, catalog and simulcast, as well as games and the Crunchyroll store. You don't have to leave your cr your Funimation watch history and Funimation queue behind. You can migrate them to Crunchyroll. Please log into Crunchyroll using your Funimation credentials. If you already have a Crunchyroll account, your accounts will be merged and you will be prompted to migrate your user information at login. As part of our transition to Crunchyroll, the price of your new Crunchyroll plan will increase from, and this seems to change here, it seems like I'm just kind of interjecting this, it seems to change on like 
which uh, like how long you've been a subscriber and such. But for this person here, Emma, theirs says uh, it will increase from $5.99 a month, like USD, to $12.49 Canadian a month beginning April 15th, 2024. Future billing will be provided by Crunchyroll. Changes will be reflected in your next billing cycle starting on April 15th, 2024, and charged to your current payment method on file. If you want to make any changes to your subscription prior to the transition, please visit your account page or your third-party access platform Form, or you may cancel at any time prior to your next billing date. The ultimate anime experience awaits. Um, so there's a lot there for some people who are saying it might not be as bad. I'm going to actually quote this from Emma Roth here stating, uh, since I'm a legacy subscriber, my price is going up. Instead of paying $5.99 per month for the Funimation Premium Plus plan I was grandfathered into, I'll have to pay $9.99 per month for Crunchy's Mega Fan plan. Uh, so that is $9.99 in uh, USD, which tracks here. And they even say, for some reason, my email lists my new price as $12.49 Canadian, which is how much Canadian users have to pay for the Mega Fan plan. Uh, so that's interesting on that. It looks like also on Twitter they stated... Uh, that one user says they'll see their yearly subscription price go from $54.95 per year to $99.99 per year. Uh, so there is going to be a price hike and a jump on this as well too, which unfortunately we've seen a lot of this here. So some people might be wondering, okay, it's just one, uh, w like, you know, one website, one service is going to be merged into another. That doesn't really sound all that bad. Aside from like the price going up, which maybe the price can be justified because, you know, maybe there was stuff on Funimation that Crunchyroll didn't have. Maybe there was stuff on Crunchyroll that Funimation didn't have, but now at this point you have all the stuff from Funimation hopefully put onto Crunchyroll, so it's kind of like you are getting two services rolled into one, and maybe that would merit, you know, a price increase, and it's not going to be bank-breaking. Uh, well, the first thing there is that I don't know if there's going to be a guarantee that everything is going to be transferred over, but secondly, the most important thing here is the main topic, which is Funimation shutting down and taking your digital library with it. Now, from what I understand here, and I'll actually just quote Emma again directly on this. To make matters worse, Crunchyroll won't support the digital copies redeemed through Funimation. This promotion allowed users to redeem digital copies of a Funimation Blu-ray or DVD they purchased, giving them the ability to store and view the show or movie through the streaming service. Funimation said users could keep the copies quote-unquote forever. But that's clearly not the case now. And this is something uh, I'm sure many people who have purchased physical media might have gotten before. Let's say you purchase a DVD, you purchase a, a Blu-ray, any time in the last 10 years. There's many times there's like voodoo codes or there's other codes. There's even like a disc there for a digital copy. And therefore, it was kind of the best of both worlds. That way you end up purchasing a physical copy. You can play it offline. You can play it on a DVD or a Blu-ray at any time as long as you have a player. But on top of that, you also have a digital only copy that you have paid for that you have access to on that account so or whichever account you're making on here so it seems like there were many Funimation blu-rays and dvds that were sold that had these digital copies so you buy a blu-ray you buy a dvd you also get a digital copy a license with it and then you can redeem that so you always own this forever and that was the idea on this here now of course this content is also going to have drm on it as well too don't don't get me wrong, it's not like they're just giving you a DRM-free copy, but still, the idea was you can get the best of both worlds. You can purchase a physical copy, and you still get the convenience of a digital copy without ever ever having to rip or back up your Blu-ray or DVD version. Uh, well, all those digital copies, all of them that you've redeemed through Funimation, they're going to be gone. They're going to be gone at this point. Um, I don't think these these ones you could say were technically sold. I don't know if they were actually sold for like money that was being exchanged, but really the digital copies that came with DVDs and Blu-rays uh, are going to no longer work starting in April 2024 once this ends up hitting, uh, thereby negating the reason for this being a quote-unquote forever copy, unfortunately. Uh, where this is going, I don't see this changing here. And I guess there's not too much else for me to say. It's more just, I can just tell people, hey, look, I know we're going toward a digital future, but don't get too comfortable with all digital ownership. You got to realize you don't own these things. Even there's options where you could rent something for less or you can buy it for more. But we've now seen time and time again that even when you buy something digital, you don't own that. You purchase a license for that digitally, and it can be revoked at any time, as shown right here. Whether 
some whether there's a licensing issue such as with Discovery Channel and PlayStation or if there's something else happening such as you know Crunchyroll folding well Funimation folding into Crunchyroll and there is the loss of all of these you know forever copies and digital download titles uh, this has happened time and time again it keeps happening I, that's why I don't really have too much else to say about this here. This is more for awareness for you all, but I feel like in, I think, the December episode when I talked about this with Discovery, I more expressed a lot more disappointment in there uh, because they were just very masked off about it. Where it was just like, hey, uh, we understand that you have paid for these products here. We understand you've paid for these digital goods, uh, but starting this date, you're no longer going to have access to them at all. We're not going to refund you for this. We're not going to give you a substitute. We're not going to do anything else. Um, even if you have them downloaded onto your system, you cannot re-download them. You cannot access them after this certain date. And that's the same thing that's going to be happening here with any of these Funimation uh, quote-unquote forever downloads. Uh, I will say this is a big reason why piracy exists. This is a big reason why people are going back to piracy. Uh, and this is also a big one up for why physical media is so important. Because when you get a Blu-ray or a DVD that does have DRM on it, it does have encryption on it. But first of all, I mean, you physically have that. And as long as you have a player and the disc is working, it will be fine. Plus, you can always take that and you can back it up yourself. There's many different programs that have done this for years. And then you can do that. You can have it on your computer. You can make another physical copy of it. You can put it on a server and host it through like Plex or MB or whatever else you want to do. Uh, but that's why having this actual ownership of like a DRM free copy or just physical ownership is so important when it comes to stuff like this. I don't know what else to say. We've seen this time and time again. It's disappointing, but, uh, you know, rip to any of that, unfortunately. So I've got another, uh, I've got another thing here. This will be a, a little more of an involved rant or maybe just like a story tell type thing. Uh, but this was how, uh, recently, you know, I guess for the last few years, there's been a few things I've sell I've been selling on eBay. It's just like things such as like duplicate games or games I don't, um, I, I don't have ownership for, or even like there's things that I might buy and then I end up flipping on eBay, what have you. There's just things that I've been selling on eBay for the last few years that just vary from, you know, a bunch of different things. Uh, now recently there's been a few things that I've been selling for my girlfriend where one of them ended up being an e-reader. And uh, what happened was, you know, I took some photos of it, I put it up on my account and everything, I end up selling it. And this story I'm sharing because uh, this was how, it, I guess this was a scam, but I, as a seller on eBay, ended up winning and I end up getting my money back. Which, for anybody who doesn't know, um, pretty much the... It's not even unspoken, but the unofficial rule, I should say, on eBay is that uh, if you are a seller, you always lose. Um, if there's an issue, if the buyer wants to return it or there's some issue of some kind, even if they're lying, the buyer will always win. That's just that's people have said that's how it goes on eBay. That's how it goes on PayPal. That's how it is. So that's why I'm pretty proud to say as a seller, I end up having uh, the final win right here. So this is what happened, right? I end up taking this uh, this e-reader, verified it was working. Uh, I actually have the same model as well, uh, but I took this e-reader, made sure it worked. I ended up wiping it so it didn't have an account on it. It was brand spanking new, well, you know, running with the latest factory OS on there. Uh, but it was an old e-reader as well too, so unfortunately, it didn't really handle things that well like it was going to be slow but i also know from having my own of the same model that just by default it is slow even when i unboxed it brand new uh it was slow now it has slowed down a little more over the years uh with you know newer updates and such but this thing is just slow by nature is what i'm saying but it's never really bugged me because uh you're not watching videos on it you don't need 60 frames per second you don't even need 30 frames per second you need like two frames a second because you're reading books on it. That's what you're doing. And it's e-ink. So not too much to worry about there. However, uh, what happened was I ended up taking this. I put it up on eBay. And it ended up selling like quicker than I expected. So I did the typical thing where I packaged it up. I printed out a label. I bundled it up. I sent it out. And it got to the buyer within a few days. Uh, now, after a few days, uh, like the same day the buyer ended up getting it, they ended up opening a return request and they said something along the lines of, hey, I ended up getting this, but 
it's really slow and the screen keeps fading in and out. And I would like to return this. Now, for the most part, on pretty much all of my listings, I have no returns set on there. Uh, because when, when I sell stuff, I try to be pretty honest about it. I'm not trying to get returns and stuff. And I will say this, like, if something is broken, I'll list it as such. If something is working, I can verify it's working. But here's the thing. I'm not a, you know, inhuman monster when it comes to this. But I kind of operate this the same way that I used to operate, uh, like, I used to work out of a local game shop. Uh, if the product gets to the buyer and there is an issue with it in some way, uh, like, let's say, uh, you know, I, this actually happened at one point. Uh, I ended up selling a game that had two discs. Um, it, like, the buyer ended up getting it. They said, hey, the first disc is working, the second one's not working, and the second one was a demo disc. Uh, so I ended up working it out with them, and I said, hey, uh, I would like to give you a partial refund. I'm giving you this much money because I believe this is how much it can be worth, and then you can take some of this money and you can go to a local shop and you can get that disc resurfaced. It shouldn't cost you more than 3 or $4 and you can get that working. And they said, absolutely, that's a really good deal. Thank you. So I end up giving them a partial refund on that. Uh, there's been other people, like let's say, you know, heaven forbid, uh, let's say I end up sending a game out and it ends up, you know, just not working at all or it's broken or something. Uh, you know, if there's an actual issue with it, I don't mind taking that back. Um, and in fact, even after this, there was another item that I ended up selling. And again, no returns on that. But the buyer ended up reaching out to me and they said, hey, so I got this and it really wasn't what I was expecting because I was expecting this and this and this here. And I was thinking of this and then it ended up being these other things. And I know you don't allow returns, but I want to know if I could return this. And I looked at it and it was honest enough. And I was like, you know what? I'm really sorry about this ad here. I know that I don't allow returns, but I will allow one in this case here um, because, you know, you've you've made your case and I can agree with it here. Um, just the only thing is you're going to have to initiate it. So please initiate a return. I will accept it and we'll work it out. And once I get the item and verify that everything is good, I'll happily return your money. And that's how it went. Uh, but before that, there was this uh, buyer with the e-reader. And they said, yeah, it's really slow and the screen keeps fading in and out. And I essentially told them, uh, much blinder, of course, than this, but I essentially said, well, it's slow, but that is to be expected. Uh, I tested it myself. I have one of these models. Uh, these things are slow. <laughs> There's no other way around it. Uh, but because you are just reading ebooks here, it doesn't need to be like a supercomputer, doesn't need to be fast on this. Uh, as opposed then with the screen fading in and out, we tested it. It wasn't fading in and in and out. Maybe that's just with the, uh, that could just be flipping the pages or something or going from screen to screen as the e-ink refreshes. I don't know. But respectfully, no, we're not going to honor a return here because th this is working. This device is working as intended. Even with the slowness, it is working as intended. There's no fault of the device. There's no damage to the device itself. And they came back and they said, yeah, I understand that, but I just didn't think it would be so slow and glitchy, so can I please return it? Uh, and we didn't want this thing back. So I said, no, I end up declining it. And of course what happened was then they escalated it to eBay. So when you escalate to eBay, uh, you as the buyer, you end up you know, making your case to them, and then the seller has to do the same thing. And so I ended up, you know, describing on there, I said, I've tested this, I made sure it worked, um, it is working just fine, even the slowness on there, the speed is to be expected for a device of this age and running this firmware, I have verified this because I have my own and it runs in the exact same way, uh, so there was no issue with this here, uh, this is just, you know, ill-tempered expectations, I guess, with what you would be expecting on the device itself, it's like buying an old computer, that's known to be slow and then complaining that it's slow. It's one of those issues. There's no issue with the computer here. It's just, hey, when you buy an old, slow computer, it's going to be old and slow. <laughs> uh, I even did give them like a recommendation for a setting or two they can tweak to maybe um, adjust performance, but there's not too much you can do, unfortunately, on there. But I sent it off to eBay and then eBay deliberated. And within a few hours, of course, I got the bad news saying that, uh, hey, we ended up uh, like we are siding with the buyer on this here. Uh, so we are going to be taking the money 
out of your account. If you don't have the funds already, we're going to be charging you for those. And the buyer is going to be sending this item back to you. Uh, and the case is closed. So that was disappointing, but I was like, you know, I figured that's where it was going to go. Although here's the thing with it, even with that, they don't give you everything on there. So like, let's say this thing was sold for a hundred dollars or so. And then after shipping and after eBay fees, you end up getting like $75, right? Uh, like net overall. Uh, this here, I end up getting, let's say like $82 for this, but I had to, I didn't even get that back. I had to pay that out of pocket. So I was, you know, kind of grumbling, kind of annoyed, but I'm like, whatever, you know, it's the first time I've dealt with this on eBay, but you know, it, it's to be expected on here. Um, and this is something that I've used as well too, not with like slowness, but years ago, I remember I bought a PSP 2000 on eBay. I got a PSP 1000. I end up opening a return case because I'm like, Hey, I got the wrong product. The buyer thought they were going to be slick by just ghosting me, but that's the other thing too. If you don't make your case as a buyer, within three days, you can escalate it to eBay, and then eBay will just side with the with, with the buyer on there, or I guess I meant seller, but with the buyer here, uh, and then at that point, you know, I got my money back. I got a prepaid label. I was able to send uh, the item back, and that was it because it, it was clear on the tin. It was like, hey, I, got a, I, I bought a PSP 2000. I got a PSP 1000 in the mail. This is not what I wanted. <laughs> So what happened here was, you know, I grumble a little bit, but I said, okay, whatever. And then, like I said, for that other uh, item I had, there was another person who they wanted to return an item. I allowed it. Uh, so within about two weeks, that second item I ended up getting back. I checked it out. Everything was okay to my standard. I returned the money to them. Uh, class act as well, too. That buyer actually ended up giving me good feedback in the end. Uh, however, with this one, with the e-reader, I waited and there was just, there was something that didn't sit right with me about it. So after about three weeks, I looked at the case again because the case was closed. And as a seller, you can appeal this case. And one of the appeal options is I never received the item. So I figured, you know, I waited an ample amount of time for this here. I went in and I decided to appeal it. And they asked for some proof or something. I didn't have any proof, but I just told them, I said, hey, look, we've been in contact. We opened and closed a case. All the contact information is there. Um, I have not received any messages from the seller or from the buyer. I haven't received any notification of anything shipped. I have not received my item back. Uh, so at this point, I either want my money or I want the item. Uh, my money is gone. My item is gone. I have not received it. I have no proof that this was sent out, so I'm appealing this because I have not received my item in the mail. So that was uh, that was a little bit annoying to deal with there, but you know I appealed it and I said, you know what's what's the worst thing that's going to happen on here? So I sent an appeal, and you know it said maybe within like 48, 72 hours you're going to get a uh, an email back. I was surprised within four hours, Class Act eBay support within four hours. I got a long email back from them. In fact, it's so long. I'm let me bring it up here. I'm actually going to read this out loud because this was a uh, this was you know a, a little bit surprising for me. And don't worry, it was uh, it was good news here. But let me see. Okay, so it said you know decision on your appeal for this case. Uh, there was that. Where was the? Here we go. And they even said the other one. There was a couple emails that said good news. Appeal granted. Refund on its way. So I think the person who was working customer service, like they really wanted to just, you know, push like, hey, this was really big right here. Um, so essentially looking through this here, they said, after careful review on your case, I found out that the case was wrongfully closed. The buyer got refunded without returning the item back to you. I see that you already declined the request, which is part of your seller protections. I honestly believe that you have done your responsibilities for this transaction to go smoothly as possible. As a result, this case will not count as a defect from your monthly evaluation, and your money will be credited back to your account within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, so that was, I mean, a small part of the email right there, uh, but that was fantastic news. And I was, you know, quite happy to hear about that. So what ended up happening was, you know, I was able to look and this time around, they end up giving me everything back. Uh, now at this date, I, I still don't have the e-reader, but it's fine because I got the money. And, you know, I said, you know, like you put it up, let's say I put it up for a hundred dollars, it sells for a hundred dollars. And then, uh, in the end, I just get like $75 back after everything. And then eBay ended up taking like 
$82 from me. This time around, they refunded everything to me. They gave me $100. They gave me a full refund for everything. So that was a nice little bonus as well, too. So I wasn't too worried because that way I got the money back. I don't have the e-reader anymore, which is great because the original intention was to sell the e-reader. So there we go. Now, the reason why I also appealed this and the reason why it was a little bit big and I was kind of bringing it up here is because I, I feel like, and I don't even fully understand the scam, but this was definitely seeming like a scam to me. Uh, because when I looked at the metadata a little further, uh, it seemed like this person, you know, they, they knew how to operate eBay. They knew how to navigate it because, you know, they paid immediately. Uh, the same day they got it, they end up issuing, they try to issue a, uh, open up a return request and then they escalated and everything. And the reason why I highlight this is because when I looked at it, this is kind of the red flag that went off for me. Before I opened up my appeal, I decided to look at their account and I saw that this person's account only had one piece of feedback and it was from me giving it to them for the sale of this device. But on top of that, it was a brand new account and the account was actually created the exact same day they ended up buying the e-reader, which shows to me that they ended up making the account almost exclusively, it seems, to buy the e-reader on there. Uh, so that's what was going on with it. The only thing I could really think of is I don't even know if they were using, you know, stolen credentials to pay for it or what. But really, the only thing I could think of is that they ended up, you know, buying up this device and then they try to do a return on there, hoping that the return would not go through. And at that point, they could just escalate to eBay, knowing that eBay always sides with the buyer, not the seller. And then at that point, they could get their money back and they could have the e-reader and they could keep it. And they were probably hoping that I would just not appeal uh, or just forget about it or what have you. Um, and I know from what I know, from what I've seen, when you do, when you offer a return, the buyer has 30 days to return it. Uh, they have that window right there. So that's why I still wanted to wait a little bit. I decided to kind of do it like strategically. I did it about three weeks out because I'm like, well, you know, it's not past the return policy on that because I'm almost afraid that I might be locked out at that point if it's past 30 days. I didn't look it up. However, I feel like, okay, you know, if this is a device you really do not want, Within three weeks, you should have at minimum sent it because it notifies you of that because the other item I ended up doing a refund on, um, I did a, I, I allowed the return, uh, did the refund, and I was notified when they printed off the label and I was notified when they initially sent it out when it had that first scan. It said, hey, your item is on the way. Uh, so I didn't get any notification that any of that happened with this here. The other thing, too, was that I ended up, and I won't say who they were, just, you know, if they want to remain private on here, but I actually ended up talking with a friend of mine about it who said about the same thing ended up happening to him. Uh, he ended up a few years ago selling a GPU on eBay. He tested it. He made sure it worked. It ended up selling. He tested it again. He packaged it up nicely, sent it out to the buyer. The buyer, the same day they got it, ended up opening a return request saying, hey, I need to return this because it doesn't work. My friend ended up saying, uh, no, I'm going to shut that down because I tested it. It's good. It's in great condition. I made sure it worked. Of course, the buyer does the same thing. Uh, they end up escalating it to eBay. eBay, of course, sides with the buyer on there. But what happened was my friend ended up pushing it further. He ended up calling up eBay support, explained to them, and apparently eBay support ended up looking at the buyer's account, saw that the buyer had a habit of doing this, and ended up voiding out that case made the buyer keep the gpu and then gave my friend his money back so that was i i guess that's kind of the scam a little bit of the hustle that happens right there uh all in all i mean hey i don't have the e-reader anymore i got the money for it and uh i got to tell a entertaining story about it on my podcast here uh so that's all to say for anybody who is going to be selling on ebay for anybody who might be running into something like that Hopefully, this elicits some hope to you all on there, uh, that there are good people in eBay customer service who are on the seller's side of house as well, too. Uh, and they do these... the. And they, they do these investigations pretty clearly here. Uh, the only odd thing was, like I said, uh, thankfully, the second person ended up looking at it separate from the original case. But they said that, yeah, we looked at it and uh, you they said it was mistakenly closed too early because 
the seller was well the buyer was given their money back before they returned the item uh which thinking about it from my history the time i had to do that with the psp that was not how it went i remember when it was escalated i was given a label i had to put that label on the package send it out and then once the item was confirmed to be delivered then i got my money back so i'm not sure what was going on there but it happens so yeah that, that's how that goes <laughs> Now, I had something that I was kind of theorizing a little bit about and just thinking to myself, and I kind of want to come on here and, you know, talk about it with you all a little bit, and I guess it's a little one-sided because I'm the one who's talking with voice, and there's going to be, you know, comments and such on here, uh, but this was me thinking about this with the Xbox Series S, the Xbox Series X, and the PlayStation 5. Now, I know this is really hard to believe, but these consoles came out at the end of 2020, not 2021, not 2022. I know, time is meaningless, but they came out near the end of 2020. And it seemed like this generation has been a, a bit lackluster. Uh, there hasn't really been anything big. The The new consoles, I mean, sure, uh, you can buy them up now. You can find them pretty easily. Uh, they do have much nicer performance. But there hasn't really been any huge games, I feel like, that people have been gunning after a system for. If you want to play a game in nicer quality, certainly. Like, if you want to play God War Ragnarok in, you know, nicer fidelity, nicer performance, you can get a PS5. Uh, many PS4 games are getting PS5 upgrades or even PS5 compatible patches. Uh, so, and for anyone who doesn't know, the, the PS5 is kind of my main system of the two. I play on that a lot more than the Xbox Series X. So there's a lot of that. Uh, big performance upgrades on there. I'm, I'm not going to poo-poo that at all. Uh, however, th there hasn't really been, for most, for the most part, any one game that make, makes people say, oh, I have to buy a new system exclusively for this. Because even some of these games, like, for example, God of War Ragnarok, uh, you can still play that on the PlayStation 4. You don't have to have a PS5 for that. Uh, Miles Morales, I know that was a big one. Uh, you don't have to have a PlayStation 5 for that. Uh, I know one of the few PS5 exclusives is Astro's Playroom, which is, uh, it, or was that, uh, I think, yeah, Astro's Playroom, I think that's what it was. Uh, great game, short, but great game built into the system, like Wii Sports in a way. Uh, but one of the other games that came out, which was an exclusive, was uh, Demon Souls which even you could argue about that because it is a remake question mark so it's not but it's not necessarily an exclusive because demon souls is on the ps3 you see what i mean uh that's all to say here i guess i'm kind of posing the question if these consoles should have been delayed by one year and i say that because you got to remember, we, we got to think about three and a half years, almost three and a half years into the past, right? You got to remember 2020, that was the year of COVID. That's where everything shut down. That's where there was supply chain issues. That's where it was impossible to pre-order one of these systems. It was impossible to buy one of these systems. Sites were crashing. Sites were not working. Payment processors were breaking. And there was a huge battle against bots. And there were so many people who were flipping and reselling these systems and, you know, reselling them for two, three times the amount easily. That's why I didn't get my consoles for a for a good while. Uh, one of my friends, big shout out to Taz, uh, you know, friend on here, friend of the channel, uh, friend of the Mr. Mario 2011 uh, Discord server that we got, and a uh, staff member on there. Uh, I got my PlayStation 5, I want to say like July 2021, so almost a year after it came out. Because it was kind of a little bit of like a sympathy sale. He was trying to help me get one. I could not get one. And he was able to get them multiple times. And he just said, you know what? I'm not using this thing. I have it. I've played like two games on it. I finished it. If you want to, I'll sell it to you for that much. And he sold it to me for an incredibly fair price. He did not scout me on it. So I said, you know what? Sure. I'll come pick it up from you. However, uh, with the Xbox Series X... Those were easier to purchase before the PS5 became easier to purchase. But I think I got my Series X in, was it February or March? I think I ended up being able to buy it February or March. It was definitely quarter one of 2022. 
So it was well over a year. It was about like, let's round up here. It was like a year and a half after the system came out that I was able to go onto a website and just purchase one of them, which is a bit unprecedented on there. Uh, I'm old enough that I can remember when the 360 PS3 Wii ended up coming out. And I know the Wii was like that to some extent where it was impossible to find. But I remember stores were getting 25 of them at a time and they were selling out within an hour each time. Uh, I think it took, it was well within the first year. Let's say it took about a year after the Wii came out for me to be able to go into a Walmart and there was one or two Wiis in stock because it was just hot of a system. PS3, Xbox 360, yeah, when they were initially on sale, of course, when a console is initially on sale, it's going to be hard to find. But you were able to find those systems, you know, after a few months. But a year and a half, almost, let's round up here, about two years into the life cycle, it was still difficult to get those systems. Because for the PS5, it, it didn't get to the point where you could find one of these systems, just walk into a store and have a good chance of finding one, until about two years it was on shelves. So that's even why it screwed up a lot of people. Because when I've had this discussion with people... A lot of people haven't, a lot of people I know, they didn't get their system until, let's say, 2022 or so. So even at the time when they got it, they're like, yeah, you know, I know the system's a year old. I'm like, no, it's two years old. And they're like, no, it's a year old. It came out last year. I said, no, it came out in 2020. And they're like, wait, are you serious? And I tell them, yes, it came out at the end of 2020. Both the systems did. But the reason why it's kind of distorted in your head is because for the first year, nobody could get a hold of these systems. They did not exist. And I know a lot of that was the supply chain issues and what was happening there. However, that is also a big reason as to why I kind of question if the console should have been delayed by a year. Uh, not only both of those systems could not be found for a long while, uh, but I know with the Xbox, for example, from what I see, the Xbox, when it came out, the hardware and the software was pretty stable, pretty on point, because it was really just a hardware upgrade to the existing Xbox ecosystem. Like, you fired it up, you booted it up, it still used the same, you know, plugins that the Xbox One, uh, well, I guess the Xbox One S or the Xbox One X ended up using, so you could just drag and drop your system, essentially. Uh, the actual system OS and firmware, aside from having, you know, a few exclusive features on there on the newer systems, was really about the same. So if you na knew how to navigate your Xbox One, you knew how to navigate your Xbox series without any issue. Uh, it it, it kind of just felt like, you know, you have a computer, let's say you have a PC and it's running Windows 11, and then you go out and you buy a new PC and you drop it in, and then you transfer your files over, it's still a PC running Windows 11. It is faster, it is probably going to have a nicer resolution if you, you know, got a nicer GPU, you got nicer monitors, things like that, but it's still just a drop and replacement, essentially, for what you were already on. It's not something that's radically different, like going from... I don't know, go, going from Windows 7 to Windows 10, something like that. So the Xbox, I didn't really see an issue with the hardware there, aside from it being, you know, hard to find, hard to purchase for a while. What I'm saying is the software is really locked in pretty well. But when it came to games, uh, this was even something I remember I told one of my friends about who I think to this day he still doesn't have one of the newer Xboxes because he's, he's on PC, he, he has a Steam Deck, and, you know, he's got a Switch for any other console stuff. But he was shocked when I told him that, I mean, it was officially said there, before the systems came out, Microsoft had said, there's not going to be any exclusives on the Xbox series for the first year. And he was shocked. Like, one of my best friends, I told him he was shocked, and I was like, no, 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 it's not that there's no games for the first year. All the Xbox One games are going to work on there. Uh, there's going to be patches that will make them better. There's going to be, you know, when new Xbox One games are going to come out, there's going to be Xbox Series builds that will come out as well, too. But what Microsoft said is the very first year, the first 12 months of the system's life cycle, there's not going to be any exclusive Xbox Series games. So really, if you were gunning after an exclusive, there was no reason to get an Xbox Series unless you wanted to play those games in higher quality, higher performance, higher fidelity, which is, you know, a good reason as well. But to me, I kind of look at that and I say, well, there's not really a reason to gun after a new Xbox that first year. Uh, which again, you couldn't really get them. You couldn't get a hold of one for the first year. The Xbox uh, Series S was easier to find, but the Xbox Series X, that's the one I'm talking about, since that was, you know, the bigger, more powerful one. And then with the PlayStation 5, this one, I, I think some of the things that came out the gate with were absolutely unacceptable. Uh, this one was different. 
the software, I, I from what I saw, the hardware seemed to be pretty sound, but it was the actual system software that had a lot of issues coming out the gate. Uh, there were, you know, games that, th there were certain games that weren't working, so I know, like, there was a list of, you know, a small amount of PS4 games that didn't work. I think there was maybe 10 PS4 games that were confirmed to not work on the PS5, and over time, there's now only, like, five or six of them that don't work for whatever reason. They're just not compatible on there. Uh, but the big things I'm talking about are... Um, the PS5, before I had it, I just saw a lot of reports about it because I didn't have it at the time, but for the first year, it experienced a lot of crashes. Uh, the system would just crash and it would reboot. Uh, games would just crash. Uh, the system was not stable at all when you rest mode. Uh, I know that's something that was finally fixed after, what, like a year, year and a half of it. But for a long while, I know one game, Returnal, for example, that game uh, ended up having a patch where it allowed you to essentially... Uh, have like some checkpoints in levels but Returnal was the type of game where you could only have one save on it and it's uh, I think kind of like a Souls type game I've actually never played it in all honesty and I don't know too much about it but from what I understand it's one of those more difficult games to play through and when you start a level you cannot save until you finish that level so if your game crashes 90% into a level you have to start at the beginning and not only the game itself was unstable, that's an issue with the development of the game, but then the developers ended up saying, well, if you need to, like, if you need to step away or something, you can put your PS5 into rest mode. But then that brought about another issue because rest mode itself was buggy, where essentially when you put your PS5 into rest mode, it kind of became a ticking time bomb for whatever game you were playing. And whenever you'd pull your PS5 out of rest mode, it was a game of chance to see whether the console would crash or not. And if the console crashed, guess what? You you lost your progress in whatever when, in whatever game was suspended. Uh, I know another one, which uh, one of my friends on here, Adam Korlick, he was talking about when he got his PS5, and he also got his PS5 uh, like he got it like a well like a year after it ended up initially coming out. This is another issue here that PS5 was plagued with, which was unacceptable. The PS5 would just delete games, no rhyme or reason. That was it. And you might be thinking, okay, well, maybe it was like a game that you ended up installing and you haven't played it for five months and uh, then you tried to install another one so the game, that like the system automatically managed the storage on there and deleted the old one. Nope, that's not what I'm talking about. In Adam's example, because credit to him, when he tests something, like when he like gets like a new system or whatever, like a new product or something, he puts it through paces of just like doing all these weird different configurations and stuff. Uh, and he is respectfully, how do I put like he is not um, like a super geeky technical dude. Uh, he is a normal end user who knows more than other normal end users there. Uh, so he is going to run into issues with things here and there, and he reports them in his reviews from what I've seen. Uh, now, what happened with it was he was saying, you know, essentially I say this because he, he got his PS5 and he just starts loading it up with games, loading it up, loading it up, loading it up, testing all this other stuff, testing all these different games, checking performance on them. And one of the examples he used was Alien Isolation, where it was a game, he installed it, he put the latest update on there, he played it, it was working just fine, he turned off his system. The next day he went to turn it back on, Alien Isolation was deleted. That was a game he just played yesterday, and it was deleted with no rhyme or reason. And yes, that bug is fixed, but it took well over a year for that bug to be fixed. And again, that that's unacceptable. To me, that's unacceptable where imagine again on your, let's say you're on your phone or you're on your computer and you just have files that just keep randomly getting deleted. And when you try to debug it, when you check through, you know, iOS or Android or Windows or whatever it is, you find out, oh, yeah, this is a bug known to the operating system and there's not really a, a fix for it right now. And it is totally random. It could be a file that you haven't opened up in three years or it could be a file you worked on this afternoon, but files are just getting deleted. Again, that is unacceptable for a product like that. So that one it got me a little more heated because I remember even some of my friends were asking about the recommendation of the PS5 after I got one. And I even told them at the time, like after I got it, I said, yeah, you know, if you find one in stores, like if you if you reg if you like the PS4 and you use it and you keep wanting to play PS4, PS5 games, if you can find a PS5, I recommend getting it. But it's also not ready for prime time. And I explained this issue to them and they were shocked. And I said, yeah, again, no rhyme or reason, but it's a known issue. It just deletes games. That's all it does. 
So with that there, you know, I would say these days, since I'm, you know, using the PS5 pretty regularly, um, the software, it's been good for a while. But again, it took well over a year for it to be like that. And issues like that, those are not small issues. Those are unacceptable issues. For your system to feature rest mode and it's not stable at all, for your system to be deleting games that are on there for its customers, and it took well over a year for those to be ironed out, while as, from what I know, the PS3, well, it didn't have a rest mode, but the PS4... I didn't know about any issues with that, with it randomly deleting games. PS3 didn't randomly delete games. So this is something that I feel like they really could have ironed out and squashed if they delayed that system by a year. Especially when you realize, again, that unless you were one of the lucky people who was able to get one early on, it was kind of like these systems didn't really exist for the first year. So that's why I'm kind of wondering with you all there if the new consoles should have been delayed by one year. And that's kind of what I'm using there. So... With that, don't worry, I'm just kind of sighing because I was uh, trying to not only catch my breath, but uh, see what else was going on here. Uh, you know, let's go ahead and navigate into a game store story. Uh, so for anybody who does not know, when I have these solo episodes, I like to tell at least one of these stories here. Uh, and this is going back to my days of working at a local mom and pop video game shop. Now, I worked there uh, for about two and a half years when I was in high school, and I stopped working there because, you know, I had gone off to college, I was in another city and everything, uh, but I was, you know, having fun working there, and it's one of those things where I describe to people, I, I actually didn't like video games while I was working there, because funny enough, I was just around them all the time, and it was kind of overexposure. But I liked the job itself for as much as I could for a first job that is retail. Uh, I also really loved my coworkers, and we had a lot of, you know, fun stories, fun times, but at the same time, it is a retail job. Uh, now, the, the two places that I worked at, because we had a couple locations, uh, they don't exist anymore. They've been closed down for several years at this point. Uh, but I guess here, this is the one I'm thinking of. You know, I I'll put it like this. Thankfully, I didn't really run into this here as much, but uh, our boss, I'll put it like this, he was a little bit of a character. Uh, now, it working there, funny enough, you wouldn't even have thought like he worked there. It was his store or his stores, but he really didn't put that many man hours in because he actually had a full-time job outside of the store. Uh, which I think is good, you know, he was, it's good and bad, he was bringing in, you know, money and all that, he was able to, you know, be stable, he had, you know, his own retirement and all that stuff there, but at the same time, I usually see that as a red flag, when a store owner of any shop ends up having a full-time job elsewhere there, because you would think that when you end up working somewhere, uh, your full-time job is going to be that store. That's going to be your lifeblood. And I just feel like if you're, you know, dedicating yourself to another place, to another employer there, uh, you're not really, fu you're not really fully dedicated to what you're doing there. That's kind of my opinion on it. Um, there's been times, and to be clear, uh, there's like shops I've been to where, for example, there's like one shop I know of where there's a uh, couple who they own and operate it. However, uh, the husband, he has a full-time job, he is employed elsewhere, and then he pretty much comes to this shop to work, uh, you know, on his weekends and evenings. But his wife is the one, she doesn't have another job, she is pretty much the, even though they jointly own the place, uh, she is the one who really operates and manages it full-time. Uh, so something like that is okay. However, I'm thinking of like another shop I've known of where there was one guy where he was working some other jobs. He ended up opening up his own shop. It was also a video game shop and it was doing well and it was doing really well and it was doing exceptionally well and then it wasn't doing as well. And I'll put it like this. I saw the writing on the wall when I found out that the owner ended up taking a full-time job at another place. And to be clear, this is not like hey, I own this store and I'm an owner and operator, I'm a CEO and I have like four different businesses. No, no, no. This is like you own and operate one business, but then you're working full time for someone else. That's what I'm talking about. And I remember I saw the writing on the wall and I was like, this shop is going to close because that's not a good sign when you're telling me that you as the owner, you have owned and operated this successful store for like three or four years, let's say. And then it seems to not be doing as well. There's less foot traffic. There's less stuff happening. There's less events. And then you as the owner end up taking a full-time job elsewhere while still owning 
and running this shop. That's not a good sign to me. So to me, this game shop I worked at was always kind of a little doomed in that regard. And it was one of those things too, where this owner, he also ended up his job he had, he was working nights. Uh, so usually during the day, uh, he might have been out and about or he was sleeping, uh, but he had a habit of coming into the store while he was working his other job. Um, like, you know, he'd take a break, he'd come to the store or something, and he'd check on everything. And the worst part was that he would nitp nitpick stuff. So typically when we would shut things down, uh, we would have to vacuum, we would wipe down the counters, we would clear off things, then we would have to face everything, meaning that we go through all the DVDs, all the movies, all the games, and we make sure they are facing outward and they look nice and proper. There's not any holes, there's not any like improper stacks, none of that. Uh, now, I was always pretty good about this here, also taking the trash out, that's another one. Uh, there was like one or two times I slipped, but for the most part I was pretty good. But typically, we would have newer people or younger people or even both who they would slip on this. You know, they're just trying to get out immediately. They are distracted. Trash isn't taken out. Uh, games aren't faced properly. Movies aren't faced properly. And it was a little bit of a... How do I put it? When I'm sure people know about this if I say it. But when you are put into a mode of don't screw up, don't screw up, don't screw up, what happens? You're probably going to screw up. It's like someone telling you don't think about elephants. What's the first thing you think of? Elephants. So my manager, unfortunately, was kind of under a, a good amount of pressure with this here because there was just some issues at the time. But essentially what our boss would do is we would operate during normal business hours. Then we would shut down the store. We would go home. He would come in at 12, 1, 2, 3, 4 in the morning randomly by the way it wasn't every night it was completely random and he would come to the store and he would start spot checking and then he would just nitpick everything uh the biggest offender i think was games that were not faced properly or movies that were not faced properly or even both and typically end up contacting my manager and end up just giving him an earful about what was going on and there would be days, and the reason why I say this is unfair is because, yeah, you know, as a manager, it's your job to make sure everything is managed properly, but there would be days that my manager wasn't even working. So let's say it was a Wednesday, and my manager was not working at any of the shops, and then that Thursday morning at 2 a.m., my boss goes in there, sees things aren't faced, then he would yell at the manager about it, and it's like, dude, the manager wasn't even working there. Um, it got to the point there was some other stuff as well, too, where it's like, he was kind of like going in on my manager a little bit. And there were like much younger employees we had that had to talk to the boss. They're like, dude, that's not cool. You can't treat him like that. And even the boss afterwards, because he wasn't like, how do I put it? He was a little bit of like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. You know, he was a little bit two-faced with certain things. Um, because essentially, you know, he, he was a sweetheart. He was a nice guy. But then, you know, something annoys him, something pisses him off, then he's going to get, here. you're going to be on his bad side for a bit. Or if the business isn't doing well, he's just angry all the time. Then when things are doing better, he's letting things slide. Um, but then even with this, it, he's not a bad guy when it comes to it because he would get mad at my manager about something. But then afterwards, you know, he would talk to one of my coworkers and be like, man, I, I feel a little bad. Should, should I have done that? Should I have done it? And again, then I'm having like these young coworkers. And, and when I say young, it's like 16, 17, 18 year old coworkers. There's like, dude, you can't treat the manager like this. Like, yeah, this one wasn't his, this issue wasn't his problem. This issue, he wasn't there that day. This issue, he wasn't at that store that day. This other issue here, you told him not to do that. And then you got angry at him because he didn't do that said thing. And the responsibility was supposed to be on someone else who didn't do that thing. Uh, so maybe not specific about, you know, the game shop there as a whole. Uh, but just, you know, something with when you work with a boss who isn't going to be the best and they're throwing out these mixed signals and everything. Uh, but yeah, that was definitely a thing that we kind of had to work around where it was essentially when I was closing down the shop, I always made sure that everything was clean. Everything was ready. Everything was good to go. Everything was faced. And like I said, there were a couple times I did slip on there. However, when it comes down to it, uh, yeah, I, I I'd say definitely unfair there, especially when you are getting blamed for things that aren't your responsibility. So yeah, that, that wasn't that was one of the parts of this store that was a little more dramatic and wasn't as fun, but you know, that's just how it goes. Now for one of the last things here, uh, you know, we got the game store story out the way, but I like to also cover what games I'm currently playing. Uh, so at the time I'm recording this, it is the day before it rolls out. So unfortunately I'm not playing this one just yet. However, the game that I'm talking about here that I ended up, you know, 
that I end up finishing uh, was Final Fantasy VII Remake. Uh, this is one of my favorite games, not only Final Fantasy VII, but I loved Final Fantasy VII Remake when it ended up coming out. Now, when it came out on PS4, I got it immediately, I played through it the first week, I absolutely loved it. And the thing is, I ended up getting it on PS5, since I had the disc, I got the PS5 upgrade for free, but then I ended up getting the Intermission DLC, which in case you don't know, is some DLC that came out. It's only two chapters. You play as Yuffie, and it takes place after the sector, is it sector? After the sector bombing. It takes place after that. So it's essentially during that interim when Cloud is separated from Tifa and Barret. That's when you play as Yuffie. But then it has a nice little bonus where, you, you know, we're pretty much at the end of this episode here, so I'm going to say a spoiler alert on this. But the nice little bonus is at the end when you finish this, you get about 5 or 10 minutes of cutscenes where it shows the gang like Tifa, Red 13, Barrett, Cloud. Um, it shows all of them outside of Midgar. So it's like the first time in years you get to see what happens when Final Fantasy VII Remake is over. Because Final Fantasy VII Remake... The entire game takes place in Midgar. As soon as they leave Midgar, that's when the game ends. Which, if you remember from the original one, is the first, like, five hours of the game. Just extended to about 25 hours, because it's super granular at this point. However, I did play a little bit of the PS5 build of it. Unfortunately, I didn't get to finish it. It was always a thing in the back of my mind where I said, okay, you know, I'm going to replay this fully before Rebirth comes out, because not only I want it to be fresh in my head, but I want to play through it on PS5. I want to see how it is. And I'll say this, it was phenomenal. It, it played beautifully. I played it in performance mode. It looked great. It played super smooth at 60 frames per second. It was beautiful. Played through intermission. That one was beautiful as well, too. And the fun thing was, I got to play this with my girlfriend next to me. Uh, she was watching it most of the time, and she was enjoying it as well, too. And I talked about this a little bit with Modsville USA in the previous episode um, from last month, which I re would recommend checking out because that was definitely a fun one. Uh, but it, it was an emotional game, too. There were a few times I cried. There were a few times she cried on there. And for me, like, my biggest my biggest moment for me, which it still hit me and I was surprised, uh, it was essentially the moment where after that sector bombing, as I said, uh, when you're playing as Cloud, he ends up waking up in the church and Aerith is there. And when you take control, it's hit me both times. But that scene, it's so lovingly done. It's so well crafted. It's so perfectly executed with how it looks, the music, the character. When you first meet Aerith, you see how her actress has brought her to life. It's such a moving scene that it's not like I was bawling, but I just started crying. And I just, you know, kind of just put the controller down for a couple minutes. And I'm just looking at that scene. And the first time, you know, it hit me because it was so moving. But the second time it hit me a little bit more uh, because it wasn't just that. But I even, you know, I was telling Modsville, I said it was kind of one of those moments where I almost got like, flashed back to the very first time I saw that scene, which it wasn't like a huge emotional thing on the original PS1. It was a very quick thing when it happens, but I went back to when I was a kid, the first time I played it when I was like nine or 10 years old. I can still remember being in the corner of the living room in the house that I grew up in. I remember the wallpaper we had. I remember the TV I was playing on. I remember the PS1. And again, you know, I remember just waking up in the church, talking to Aerith and moving on your way. But I just have that still burned in my head, and I think that's because the music is so excellent, so well done for that. So it was kind of one of those things, you know, I think of a very happy moment in my life. Just like, you know, that time when you're a kid, everything's happy-go-lucky and all that. Uh, and again, Final Fantasy VII, it's a very important near and dear game to me. So I was incredibly happy to not only like play through that again, but experience it with someone I absolutely love. So... That was definitely a fun one there. Uh, she thought it was entertaining. There were a few times, like, you know, she might have done something else or she was, you know, checking on something else or what have you. It was in the background. But there were a few times where, like, let's say, you know, she was doing something or she was sleeping. When a scene was happening, I was like, okay, I got to save here or I'm going to pause because she has to see this. And the scene I wanted her to watch was uh, when you're in Shinra headquarters. And I actually did this for the first time. When you go upstairs, you can either go up the stairs or take an elevator. First time I played through the game, I went up the stairs, and I was dying laughing. 
The second time I played it, I decided to take the elevator. And, you know, interesting, you get to fight a few enemies and stuff, and it's faster. But I ended up making a save point right before that decision, because when she ended up sitting next to me again, I said, hey, I gotta reload this save because you have to watch this. And if you don't know, again, some spoilers here, but you end up going up these stairs, and it's in real time. It is like 10 minutes of walking up stairs. You as Cloud, Barrett, and Tifa. You're walking up these stairs. It takes like 10 minutes to get through them. The whole time, it's like at first, like Cloud is, you know, he's just really stepping, and then he slows down, and then he slows down more, and then he slows down more, and it's like by the end, it's taking him like two seconds to make each step. And he's just going so slow up there the entire time. Tifa is just running up ahead until about the 40th floor. Then she gets out of breath. Barrett is complaining. Cloud is complaining about Barrett complaining, giving him attitude and all that. Uh, probably my favorite line there, Barrett, he just yells. He's like, this sucks. I want to go back. He just ends up yelling that. Um, and then even the detail that the attention to detail, if you have ever worked out hard enough to the point where like your hearing kind of starts getting messed up a little bit, the same thing ends up happening. I even turned up the volume so my girlfriend would notice and she loved it where it's like you're just going up so many flights of stairs and cloud is so tired that the music and the sounds end up getting warped and distorted in real time. So her takeaway from that, she thought it was hilarious she <laughs> she was saying, she's like, why am I out of breath? I'm just watching this and my, I'm out of breath. Why am I out of breath? And uh, also her consensus is that there is no way that Cloud cannot have scoliosis. <laughs> so that is the game that I end up finishing. And, uh, you know, this is coming out the day before Rebirth. So I'm all ready for that. I started playing a little bit of Crisis Core Reunion, which I got at the end of... 2022 but i have not fired up until now and i'll be honest uh i played it was a cool game on the psp and i think this was a well done remaster of it the cutscenes look good the game itself looks good um the positives it is a ps5 game that's been well it's a psp game that's been remastered for ps4 ps5 and switch i suppose the downside it is quite literally a psp game that has been remastered and that's about it. Like, you know, the handling is nice, but with that, when you play it, if it feels a little off or just kind of feels improper, I guess, it's because it was a PSP game that was very loyally, I'll say this, it was loyally remastered, but it was not remade on the newer systems. Um, so even with that, it's funny because I end up getting it on PS5. But because of the medium and the format it's on, and after playing it on PS5, I'm like, you know, I want it on PS5 because, you know, I'm playing Final Fantasy VII Remake on PS5, I want Crisis Core on PS5, I want Rebirth on PS5, but after playing it on PS5, I'm like, you know, maybe I should have gotten the Switch copy of it, because, like, at that point, it's, you know, I, I was used to playing Crisis Core portably on a PSP, it's almost kind of returning to form, I could play it portably on the Switch, <laughs> Uh, so it's not a bad game, but it is quite literally a PSP game, F for better or for worse, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then, of course, the other game I've been playing has been uh, Ring Fit Adventure, still doing that Monday through Friday. I actually plan to. I got a little bit late to it today, admittedly. Uh, so once I uh, record this and get it rendered out and everything, I will be doing some Ring Fit Adventure, um, since I'll need some time while this is rendering out and such. So that's about it for this episode here for February of 2024. Uh, hopefully next month um, I'll have a guest on and maybe we could talk a little bit about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth because I am trying to play through that. Uh, I am excited about it. It's actually one of the few games in a long, long time I pre-ordered and I plan to get day one uh, because I don't want to wait for this one. Uh, it was the same thing with Final Fantasy VII Remake. I did not want to wait for it. I got it on launch. I don't have any regrets about it. I did the same thing with Rebirth here, so it's going to be exciting. Plus, I'm going to get to play, you know, net new on PS5, not like play it on PS4 and then go back to PS5 later on. So that's going to be a real fun time overall. But for the very end of these episodes here, I do like to extend a thank you to you all for listening and watching however you're going to be consuming it. And 
Then I like to pick a keyword or a key phrase. So you can use this in a comment on the video upload and I'll know that you've made it to the end of this episode. Uh, and for this here, I have a letter because this was essentially a survey that I got in the mail that I did and I packaged back up and I have to send it out the next time I go outside. Uh, so how about we go with letter? Uh, what is your favorite letter of the alphabet? When was the last time you end up mailing a letter? When was the last time you end up receiving a letter? If you use the word letter in your comment on the video upload here, I will know that you've made it to the end of this episode. Anyways, that is about it for this episode of Mario's Minute. I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you all were entertained. And if you enjoyed this episode, a like would absolutely be appreciated. If you didn't like it, a dislike is fine as well too. But as I always say, this is Mr. Mario signing off. Thank you for listening and watching everyone. And until next month.